Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Conversations with Calvin, We the Species. And, and I've said this a few times in the past, but uh, uh, boy, do I mean this. Am I thrilled to have Howard Berg here? And uh, uh, real quick, I'm going to say that he's the fastest reader in the world and made the 1990 Guinness World Book of Records reading 28,000 words per minute, which is beyond my comprehension because I'm a slow reader. But I, I am so honored, Howard, to have you here uh, because I know you've been on 2,000 radio and TV shows, literally. 2,000, and you're here on Conversations with Calvin. Uh, 2001. Chronic, now, <laughs> by the way, that's great. That's great, Stanley Cooper. <laughs> You must be a Kubrick fan, you know, he's a New York guy. I think you are too. And uh, so uh, chronologically, uh, it's December 3rd. Uh, uh, Howard is dressed uh, uh, a lot uh, more coolly than I am. I'm dressed warmly. Uh, that's a geographical thing. Um, he's down there and I'm up here in Jersey. Uh, so uh, that's my... I say this all the time. It's my Johnny Carson monologue, which I've just done. I don't do current events because I don't like doing current events. But anyway, <laughs> Howard, thank you so much for being here. Maybe uh, just a, a quick little bio, if you'd like, throw a few things in, and, and then we'll jump in because there's so much okay. to unpack with you. Well, I grew up in Brooklyn, not in a good part. I was in East New York, which was not a great place. I, I lived in the projects. And uh, a lot of gangs. This West Side Story without the music and dancing. I met Bernardo. We had a knife. He wasn't dancing. He wasn't smiling. And I'd been beaten with bats and had people try to kill me several times. But I found one safe place in the neighborhood, the library. Apparently, gang kids will treat libraries like vampires treat churches. They, they, don't, they don't go there. So I read a lot at college reading when I was 11. So I went to the State University of New York Binghamton when I was 17 to major in biology. And in the second half of my junior year, I get interested in how the brain works. So I told the dean, I want to be a psychobiologist, not a psychotic biologist. That's Frankenstein. Psychobiology is biology behavior. And he said, well, you only have one year left. You have no psych courses. You have to do the whole program in one year. It's four years long. And you have the bio program. And I had three jobs, I was working 18 hours a week. And he said, you also have to take two labs. So that meant 18 credits of science, two four hour labs, took lab reports back then were on slide rules. So it took 16 hours. It wasn't like today, you throw the numbers and you push a button, you did by hand, it was hard. So he said, you're not smart enough. And that's when I realized they never taught me how to learn in school. They told me what and why and what would happen if I didn't learn, but not why you hear a song on the radio once, you never forget it. Then you read the seven habits of highly affected people and the next day you don't know any habits. So I learned how to learn. I got up to 80 pages a minute. I did the four year psych program in one year. I took wow. the GRE in biology and I reviewed 48 books in three nights like biochemistry, cell physiology, genetics. I got three questions wrong. So I got an 800. I was in the 99th percentile. And then it was like, gee, is it me or the system? Because there's a difference between you're a weird guy, can learn faster, you can teach others what you're doing. So I took kids 11 to 15 years old and taught them the system. And they did a semester of lifelong developmental psych, a sophomore course in a week, 30 chapter book, and 15 out of 18 passed the AP test, the full credit. So you're 11 years old, you did a sophomore college class in a week and got credit. So I said, okay, it's not just I can do it, I can teach it. And that's what I'm doing here today. I'm going to share some of the things I've learned about the brain and how it learns so our audience can begin taking charge of their information rich world where what you know determines whether you make money or you're broke. The only job security in today's world really is between your ears. That's it. It's what you know. So at uh, reading at 28,000. 25. 25,000. Yeah, uh, it, I, 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 it sounds better, but I, I'd rather be honest. That's all right. Uh, I, I'm trying, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to visualize. So I'm looking at that bookcase behind you. 
theoretically, you could um, you could take one section to that bookcase in, in an hour and knock it off. Well, I've done ten books in three hours. Wow! Very. I'll give you a good. I had a reason. I wanted to go to Hawaii with my wife on a cruise, and I worked on ships, and I they had a free cruise to Hawaii. So they said, well, they don't want speed reading, which that's what I want to hear, because that's what I want to do. So what do they want? Said, well, they want someone to teach photography, Photoshop, and video. Well, she wanted to go, and I didn't want to say no. So I said, well, I teach that, which I didn't. But I did know I could read 10 books in three hours. And if you learn what's in 10 books in three hours, you can teach. You learn something. It's, it's, that's why school is eight to 10 classes in a major. So I read 10 books on Photoshop day one in three hours, learned that. Next day, I read 10 books on how to take pictures in three hours. And next day, 10 books on how to do video. So I got to the ship and said, please, let these people not know what a camera is. I, my, I was hoping my first question would be, what do you mean they don't use film? How do they take pictures? That was my perfect audience. The first person is a professional photographer, 38 years. He wants me to teach him how to take pictures. And the second guy's doing Photoshop for five years, wants me to teach him advanced Photoshop. And my wife's sitting in the front row crying. They said, if I didn't do it, they throw us off the boat. Not in the water, but when we got to the shore. So at the end of the week, like, how many years did you study to learn all that information? And I learned last week in three hours. But that's really, the, that's about, I hate reading. I love learning. Reading's a screwdriver. It's not a goal. It's the information. Imagine you're in business, and I had an 84-year-old read three books in three hours. So a normal person could read at least a book in an hour. So imagine every day for the next year, you learn 365 skills, like marketing, selling, communicating, Photoshop, every day. Where would your business be a year from now? 10 years, 20, 30. Who gets up and says, I hope I know less today than I knew yesterday? I want to make less money today than I made yesterday. I want an uglier partner for my life partner than anyone has. Nobody. And so it's all based on what you know. So basically by teaching people to learn and use information better, it completely changes the whole game, what they can do and what they can make and what their options are. So that is a good segue. Uh, so at this point in time, how do you, help other people succeed. I, I know you have your, your, your Berg Learning. Uh, yes, berglearning.com. We have reading, writing, memory, and math. Reading doubles your learning rate. And it not only, to me, speed reading doesn't work. The way it's taught traditionally was a waste of time. You, you know, it's a math book. It's a bio book. You didn't learn any math. You didn't learn any bio. If you slow down and learn, you lost your speed. So I looked at reading is to find what you don't know and need to learn. And I teach people what to look for. Then if you didn't understand it, it isn't a reading problem. It's a comprehension problem. How do you comprehend things that are confusing? Different set of skills. How do you remember it so you can actually use it when you need it? Another set of skills. And a big piece is EQ. How do you stay in the right frame of mind to use it? So let's feel I teach you to drive. You're ready for your road test. You fail. Why? I got nervous. It was a test. That's an EQ problem. What if I also taught you to stay calm during the test? How many more successful students would I have? So by teaching reading, comprehension, memory, study skills, how to stay in the right state, how to remember and recall, now you've got a Swiss Army knife. And you could really learn very technical things like organic chemistry, medicine, law, or anything. On the, if you can do that, you can do anything. That's the hardest. It doesn't get much harder than that. So it works for every level of learning, whether it's reading a novel or a newspaper, or you're preparing for surgery and learning a new surgical strategy. Where you have to know every minute detail perfectly and not almost know it. You don't want to be with a pilot who got a C minus in landings. It's probably not a good idea. <laughs> Oof. Oof. Yeah. Been uh, with a few of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, I haven't, fortunately. Um, I kind of like, I like being grounded. I don't like, you know, I sit in an airplane and, and I'm sitting in the back and reading or uh, uh, 
I'm looking out uh, the window. It reminds me of an old Rod Serling and his Twilight Zone. You know which one I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. I, that might have been Shatner. Bill Shatner. Was that Bill Shatner? That was William Shatner. Was Bill very Shatner young. was sitting very there looking out, uh, looking out the uh, the window there, and he sees the gremlin. But I, mm -hmm. I look out when I uh, uh, in an airplane, and when I used to sit at the window, I don't do that anymore. But I, I look at that uh, little engine. It's not that big. And I'm saying to myself, well, that thing is holding all of us up. And 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 that's very uh, disconcerting for me. Uh, I, I don't, uh, so that's why I don't sit at the window anymore. And, and I usually sense. ask the person sitting next to me, can you close the, you know, the shade? I, I don't want to look out. Um, and show oh, it's so beautiful to look out. No, I, I just don't want to look at that engine. Um, <laughs> So uh, I get it. I get that. Yes. So you've that you you've done fourteen of these learning programs, right? You've had fourteen of these. Many, programs. many more. I've done so many. I just did one last week. Uh, more people today are reading e-readers than books. They're reading Kindles. They're reading laptops. They're reading iPads. They're reading on their phone. And I said, you know, nobody's really adapted reading and learning to e-reading. So I made a program and had a master wow. reading on wow. electronic devices. It's a little different. It, some of the strategies are the same. I mean, reading is reading, learning is learning, memory is memory, but the input, the medium you're using is dramatically different. So I created a program just addressing that one issue. And we're giving it as a bonus when people get the reading program now, we have that as a bonus program, an add-on. <clears throat> because I said, you know, the percentage of people reading physical books is diminishing, but they're still reading and they're still learning. So we have to kind of give them the new skills to stay in the 21st century. We're, we're not using quills anymore. So we should be teaching them how to read on e-readers and that's what I'm doing. So uh, a little bit of an off topic. Uh, it's funny, I've, I've always wanted to ask this. I never had the opportunity to. My wife was an ele elementary school teacher uh, and she did it uh, in Brooklyn, as a matter of fact, uh, for a bunch of years. And then we moved to suburban Jersey and she did it here. And when my son was born, my son, somehow, I don't know how it began, but when he, he was old enough to look and visually look and then, of course, read, he got into comics. And, and my wife, uh, being the educator, I'm, I wasn't, said it's perfectly OK for him to read comics and boy did he read comics and it changed the course literally uh, Howard of his entire life and his imagine so even reading comics so my question to you is even reading comics uh uh prolifically is is good oh absolutely I did it um my son hated to read which wasn't my favorite thing my daughter loved it my son hated it how do you get a child to read who hates to read? Well, here's a good way to do it. Find what they do like. My son liked video games. Yeah, I want him to want video games? No, but that's what, that was who he was. That's what he liked. So I got him a subscription to the Nintendo magazine. And he sat and waited at the mailbox every month, the day the magazine was coming. Wow. And he devoured it. He devoured that magazine. He learned every strategy. He memorized every shortcut, every methodology that they presented became the best gamer his teacher called one night to ask him how to beat a game he was that good but you know what it made him a good reader he wasn't reading because i wanted him to read he was reading because he had a passion for a topic that i was giving him reading material on he didn't have to be asked to read he wanted that information and that's how you get a child who's not engaged in the reading process. They're not reading Shakespeare and Hemingway. They're reading Superman and Green Lantern or they're reading Nintendo Magazine. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Their brain is learning how to process data. And as they mature, their tastes will change. They'll evolve. They'll, they'll have much better choices when they're older. And so, yes, even a comic book could be very helpful, especially for a younger child who's just starting to master the skill, it gives them more incentive. It's less challenging than reading uh, 
Shakespeare or Lord of the Rings when you're eight years old. It's a little hard to read through some of the elfish language when you're eight. So it's not a bad thing. It's reading okay. itself is the gift. Okay. And you know, it's funny. I always wanted to ask somebody that. Uh, I, I and, and I've graded, and of course, my son's all grown up now. Uh, and, and has actually been in the comic book industry. As a matter of fact, worked for DC Comics for a while. Oh, nice. Yeah, um, and he actually wrote uh, a graphic. He was a, a, a writer and a contributor uh, to a graphic comic that won the Eisner Award, which is the Academy Award of Comics. So I Thank guess- you. It, yeah. I guess it it, it 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 all worked out. So yeah. uh, next question: why, why do we read so slowly? Um, and uh, you can read in a car like at seventy miles an hour, uh, and and that can be easier than than reading like two hundred words a minute. Uh, when we why? read a car, we're reading front, back, left, and right. We're also watching our gauges. We're also watching our GPS. We're on the phone. We're talking to a friend in the car or on the radio, all at the same time, many times. And it's effortless. It's so effortless, you're bored. You read a book at around, the mode is 200 words per minute, and it's in front of you. And yet, the next day, you might remember 10% of what you read. Why is it so much easier to multitask at 70 miles an hour in four directions in a car than at 200 words a minute in a book. And there's a reason, and it's the secret to why you read slowly. When you're in a car, you're processing all the data visually, it's analog. You're taking everything in at once. When you're reading a book, it's like someone's sitting in back of your head pronouncing one word at a time. We're actually using our eyes to hear a book. And it's not very practical. Hearing is digital. When you look at a painting, you see it all at the same time. When you listen to music, it takes time for it to play. So speech is digital, it's one word at a time. A page is analog. All of the data is in symbols called letters and they're right in front of you as soon as you turn the page. I read a page in half a second. You see all that data at the same time, it's visual, but you're not processing it that way. You're digitalizing an analog environment, creating a bottleneck that slows you down. So most people are reading at the same speed they speak. And that's a big bottleneck. Well, a normal person can go 100% to 400% faster in a few hours. If you'd like, I could show you the first step to getting started. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so when we're done, pick a book you've read. Preferably nonfiction. It's got more structure. Novels are designed to take you to an unexpected yeah, ending. I like that when you know, I, 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 I'm such a slow reader. Um, I'll speed you up 20, 40 percent right now. Right. Wow. Um, should we mean right now on air? Or? Yeah, right now. Yeah, right now. The next 90 seconds. All right. I'm gonna grab... You don't need the book. I'll just tell you what to do. And when we're done, you can do it. It's, it's it won't take long. All right, here's nonfiction. Right okay, here. perfect. That's a perfect book. The so what you do, now. yeah, yeah, but don't read it right now because it'll take too much time up. Yes, I'm just going to tell you the steps. But when you okay. do it later after the interview, you'll see a 20 40 percent increase instantly. Wow! So, first step is you get a timer, it could be a smartwatch or a phone, smartphone. A lot of people have them today. Time yourself for a minute, read normal, nothing special. See how far you go. That's an assessment. How fast can I read? And now you know what you're doing currently with your current skill set. Perfect. And you take a pen or pencil, mark off where you finished. Okay, that's how far I read now. Now we're going to learn how to speed up. Go to the second chapter. Take your hand and go across one line at a time with your eye following your hand as fast as you can comprehend. So as long as you know what you're reading, go quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker till suddenly you don't know what you're reading. That's when it got too fast. Since you understand the book already, there's only one thing that can confuse you. It's your speed. Well, you're going too fast. So slow down just enough that the comprehension comes back. And for five minutes, one line at a time, no slower or faster than you can comprehend. Now go back to the first chapter where you tested yourself for a minute and get the timer and time yourself again one minute using your hand 
as fast as you could comprehend. And you're going to go 20 to 40% further than that mark that you made in the first wow. minute. Just doing that one single change. That's the first step. It okay. takes a few hours to go 100 to 400%, but that's the first step. Wow. Now, if that's you'd like, I could show you about comprehension, which I think is more important. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, I, I, I just want to go off topic for one second. Sure. 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 Uh, <laughs> uh, well, because I'm, I'm digesting. By the way, I'm going to do that when we're done for sure. Cause I have a stack, by the way, I have such a stack of books to read because uh, everybody gives me a book to read and, and, and I'm so far behind. So um, completely, uh, uh, extraneous Howard uh, here's the scenario uh, excluding family or friends uh, somebody living or dead you'd like to spend the day with um there's a few I could think of Buddha would be one okay that's great he'd be an interesting guy to talk to yeah. and you figure this is a guy who figured it all out had the answers to existence that would probably be uh, of course you'd have to learn how to speak in his in his hindi language it would be a little challenging i don't know if he learned english <laughs> i know he knew a lot but i'm not sure he studied english <laughs> but that would be I, einstein would be another person i had a lot of role models i was interested most kids that baseball and football I was my role models were Da Vinci, Isaac Newton, Galileo, uh, Einstein. You said Einstein. You see what I have here? Yeah, he was one this. of my favorite people. I've had yes. this his yes. picture of his eyes uh, on yes. my desk for fifteen years. He's an amazing man. Yeah, and uh, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, was in that league. People don't realize what Franklin was about. He was incredible. He invented bifocals. He invented central heating. He he did so many. And then he was a diplomat. And he was a scientist. And he was a philosopher. And he was a writer. And he helped write the Constitution. I mean, the man was just off the scale intelligent. And so those are the people that I emulated growing up. I, I couldn't care less how fast someone threw a ball or hit the ball. It's like, who cares? What does it do for me? It doesn't change anything. Well, when you discover the laws of motion, well, the, the theory of relativity, I mean, that's like changes reality. I mean, that's someone who's changed reality. I mean, I imagine. Now that's someone I want to hang out with. That's someone I want to know. I mean, I, I admire the skill that these people have throwing balls. I'm not knocking it. It's a talent. It's a skill. It's it's it def, but I don't care how far they hit a ball or how fast they throw a ball. I want to know someone who can change reality and totally shift a perception of what's real and what isn't. And these people did that. They 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 just completely shifted society from where it was to where it is today. Mm -hmm. And those are people I want to know. Interesting you said that because I, I ponder as I'm staring at Einstein's. I I can't forget I forget the whole relativity thing, but I can't even comprehend uh, how his mind conceived of what it did in 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 1900 uh, before the internet and Google. I mean. Yeah. And when there was nothing there, so how did this mind conceive of that? So I can't, I can't even, and I get frustrated. I can't even process how the mind worked for him to have done that, much less he, even understand it. He did thought experiments and he visualized hy hy hypothetical. What would, what would if you measured light and you were traveling uh, as you were traveling next to this beam of light, you measured it. Would the speed change as you move towards it or away from it? Now, if you're driving in a car and you're driving at the same speed, the car next to you looks like it's going at the same speed. It's not moving much. If you hit head on or a car coming from the other direction, it's a big difference. But ironically, with light, whether you measure it next to it or going towards it, 
the speed stays the same. It's a constant. And that was the, and that's, and when you think about the old rate times time equals distance. Well, if the rate is a constant, which is what light is at all frames of references, then distance and time have to behave differently. The distance over time is rate. So if the rate is a constant and you move, whether you're moving towards it or away from it, the rate stays the same, then something's going on with distance and time. And that's what he was thinking about. Now, the difference was he, able, he was able to quantify that mathematically. He could measure precisely what that alteration in time and distance would be in different frames of reference, which is absolutely brilliant. But that's really what the theory is about, that um, time and, and distance, which we would have thought were constants. Time is time. Distance, no. Time and distance are not a constant. So the light traveling from a star in outer space, let's say it's traveling a billion light years, it gets here when it, when it left. For you, it's a billion years in your frame of reference, but it's traveling at the speed of light. And at the speed of light, there is no time. It's hard to conceive of that. Time doesn't exist. There is no time. It's always in the present. And so it gets here when it left. And yet for the observer, who's in a different frame of reference, not moving at the speed of light, billion years passed. And say, so how could that be? You're telling me if I measure it myself, it took a billion years to get here. But if I was the light traveling, it took no time. It got here when it left. Yes, that's the theory of relativity, that time and space are relative because the speed of light is a constant. That's really wow. fundamentally what he was doing. Wow. Is that kind of related to uh, the, the Schrodinger's cat? Yes, it is. Yes. Um, Schrodinger's cat is about things exist in multiple states, but when you make a measurement, only one state is observed. So theoretically, if you flip a coin, it's a head or a tail. That's in the phenomenal world we live in. But in the quantum world, they'd say, well, it could have been a head or a tail. So it was both. So on one timeline, the one we're on, we saw a head, but the tail happened. It just didn't happen on this timeline. It happened on another timeline that we're not conscious of, but we're on that timeline. And in that timeline, we also perceived it as a different event. Wow. That's kind of what Schroeder's cracked. There's, yeah. there's multiple possibilities, but only one is observed. But it doesn't mean the other possibilities don't exist. And it doesn't mean they didn't happen. They may have happened, but on a different timeline. Okay. I'm so glad I, I knew about that. Uh, I, I, I read a little. Story. I read a lot. <laughs> uh, you sure do. Uh, you sure do. Uh, I, I don't, but I, I, uh, I, I kind of, I'm like a dilettante. I, absor I absorb as much as I can. You like to see the mind of God because it's related to those two issues. Wow. The mind of God. Uh, who wrote that? Nobody. Nobody? I, me. You, oh, interesting. The mind of God. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what do we just find out? At the speed of light, there's no time. So let's, just, let's assume God isn't a thing, but it's a field of consciousness. Like the Higgs bows, like the Higgs field. It's a field of consciousness. It's expanding faster than the speed of light. So it exists forever outside of time because if it's going at the speed of light, there's no time, so it's eternal. Okay, so when we look at time, we see the front of us is the future, behind us is the past, and where we are is the present. That's how most people perceive time. But if you're a being moving at the speed of light, it's a panorama. There is no past, there is no future. It's all happening now. So you see it as a, think of a movie screen where everything exists simultaneously on the screen. You can see everything on the timeline, but not as a series, but as one timeline all at the same time. Now that would be step one. Now, what do we discuss with Schrodinger's cat? That there are multiple possibilities. So imagine for every point in time, for every decision that was made, an alternate decision was made. Instead of someone saying, yes, I'll go out with you, they said no. Instead of getting the job, they said no. 
Every decision had an alternative decision. Those are perpendicular to the timeline you're on. So every existing moment in time has an infinite number of alternative possibilities. And that's for just one person. Now take all of the alternative infinite possibilities of all people and all conscious entities in the universe, recombining to form an infinite number of secondary, tertiary, quaternary alternative realities. And that's the mind of God. Everything that can happen happens. Everything that didn't happen happens. All possibilities that can possibly happen, happen. And you observe all of reality from every perspective, every outcome, every permutation, and every alternative. And you're cosmically aware of everything that could possibly occur. And so your whole existence is based on consciousness and total understanding. And I think that's the mind of God. Wow. Wow. Hey, I got I, that I, in a dream. <laughs> this is great stuff. Uh, and, and I love, I love kind of. Uh, I don't normally talk about that, but no, it seemed like that might interest you. So it I does I'd share. interest me. Uh, uh, it does tremendously. I just finished writing, um, and I'll get you a copy, uh, my second novel. Uh, um, I j literally just finished, and I'm doing my little editing, and I'm going to ship it off to New York. But half the title is a uh, journey to spirit, which oh, is, okay, which uh, is, is in some way is what you talked about the mind of God. Well, so explain something. Why does so many bad things happen? You see, how come God lets it? He does it. Everything happens. Every bad thing didn't happen, and every good thing didn't happen. Nothing. Everything to do happens. <laughs> it's everything. It's just that you're experiencing that one dimension or timeline. So on your timeline, that's what happened. But all the other things happen too. The good things, the bad things, and the good things. So there is no good or bad. It's just total consciousness observing every probability and permutation. And so, no, it doesn't change anything because it's changed. Everything happens. And we just don't perceive it. And I think that makes more sense than what we're experiencing, which is sometimes how could there be a just and moral consciousness responsible for all the crap we see going on around us and when you think of it that way it doesn't matter because it doesn't happen it happens the other way also it's just observing every permutation and possibility so there's neither good nor bad it just is it is it, it just it, is it, which it is, is what I, buddha said that's what buddha said uh, the, there's no it just is you know, just you're is. looking for a reason it just is it's consciousness it's pure consciousness i say all the time it is what it is it is what it is it is what it there is you go my, one of my favorite expressions wow if you're writing a book i could show you to write a book in a day if you'd like i wrote my last book in five hours uh well this is well this it took me two <laughs> years uh uh took me oh. two two years uh in a retired state in other words i wasn't my first novel I wrote, it took me like five years because I was working full time. This, okay. took, me, this took me two years. It should be uh, one day. Would you like to have us do it in one day? Uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, Here's how you do a book in a day. Tell me. Okay. I would, it's gonna I, presume, I'm going to presume first we're doing a small book, 40 or 60 pages. If you want a bigger book, you just do the same thing every day for a week. You have 400 pages. Okay, you know how to do PowerPoint. So yeah. You set up your ideas on a PowerPoint. Okay, I basically do nonfiction. So I set up my, my PowerPoint and then I recorded it in, you could use Camtasia, which will record your screen. If you save it as a video, it's a video product. If you save it as an audio, it's an audio product. But if you play back your audio through your speakers, with your microphone next to your speakers, go to Google Docs. And if you go to Google Docs, there's a tool. And the tool is text, voice to text. It's listening to you do your, per, your, your speech for your PowerPoint and transcribing it to text. That's the first draft of your book. Wow. You speak it and it'll automatically transcribe it. You'll have to clean it up. You may have to go a few edits, but you could do a 40 to 60 page PDF book in a day, very, very easily doing that. If you could talk to an audience using PowerPoint and record it, 
without the audience. It's a book. Wow. And you just have to have sections. Each chapter is a is another day's work if you're doing a larger work. And so you could literally do four or five hundred page book in a week or a 40, 60 page PDF book in a day, doing it that way. And I teach people how to get into flow in my writing program so they can easily come up with the ideas and the organization and the flow that they want from their material. And then it becomes relatively easy just talking. And when you're done talking, you got your first draft done. And you can do that. That's not hard. Now, this does this work better for nonfiction than fiction? I'm not a non, I'm not a fiction writer myself. Uh, okay. Um, okay. I rarely read fiction. It's not that I don't. I prefer a movie. I saw, I read The Lord of the Rings and I saw the movie. I thought the movie was better because the names were all so similar and hard to differentiate with the with the dwarfs that. The only way I was able to really tell one from the other was seeing their faces on the screen. One guy had one kind of beard and no one had it. You knew who they were, but their names were so simple, so similar and, and pronounced so similarly, like Sorin and Sorian. It was just, there was so much uh, overlap in pronunciations that when you're reading 80, 90 pages a minute, it was hard to distinguish one from the other. So. I, uh, I personally prefer movies for fiction, but I love nonfiction and I primarily look for what can I learn today that will make me smarter so I can make more money and be more productive. That's really, and I'm all over the map. It's not just science. I read music, how to learn guitar, I learn languages, I learn math, philosophy. Uh, the more you mix up the bottle, the more dots you put on the map that don't fit the more discord you put in there, the more you're shaking the box and something wonderful comes out that nobody ever thought of before because nobody took the time to put those dots on their map because most people tend to read what they read. Medical books if you're a doctor, law books if you're a lawyer, architectural books if you're an architect. But if you're reading a little all over the map, suddenly you've got information data that no one's brain has had before and you see patterns and relationships between these unrelated areas and you see relationships and now you're able to do things no one ever thought of or dreamt of or even thought could happen and to me that's where innovation comes from it comes from what you know if you know what everyone else knows exactly the way they know it the best you could do is repeat what they've already done. But when you've got permutations and combinations that your brain can create that no one's been able to do before because you've put that unique blend of information and data in one place, now you can do incredible things. Wow. Wow. Well, my head is swimming from you. Oh, in a good way. <laughs> in a very good way. I love when my head goes swimming. That's my expression. And you've done that. Um, I, I, you know, I, we, this has been great. Just one, one quick, one more quick question, because I, I could probably want to hang around with you for a long time. But uh, you could come back. We've got so many yeah, more things but anyway, to do. We sure can. Uh, and, and you know what? I, we could just do an off. Just off, I mean, we, we we wound up talking about Ben Franklin and Einstein and Schrodinger's cat. Who knew? Fine, I like that. I yeah. I like when it goes off my preset format. Right. It's more stimulating to me because there's a uniqueness. And the I mean, you repeat just like I said, I did seven podcasts in one day last week, over and over and over. It's like being on stage every night with the same script. And yeah, you make money doing it, but it's not the same as doing a new play every day. And so the uniqueness itself is more exciting to me. I enjoyed it. Great. And so did I. Uh, and I love doing this. And, and uh, you're amazing, you know, uh, you. Uh, outside of the fact that you do look like Bill Shatner. And that's why I brought him up. Uh, <laughs> that's I, what my wife said. There's a method to my madness because you, you, you could do, do worse. You could yeah, do no, worse than sure. You sure can. 
By the way, would you, let me ask you something, Howard, uh, off topic. If you had the opportunity, would you go up in a rocket like Bill Shatner? No. No. And there's a reason. I have an actual reason. I have motion sickness. Okay. So when I was a child, I was about six, I wanted to be an astronaut. I went on a, on a merry-go-round on the stationary horse, not the one going, and I got nauseous that I threw up. And I'm even as a child, I said, you know, if you're on a stationary horse on a merry-go-round and you're ready to puke, probably a spaceship isn't the best place for you to be going. Correct. And I thought that makes, and I still agree with my, my deduction as a six-year-old. Wasn't the, not that I wouldn't love to experience that, but knowing that I get sick on a stationary horse on a merry-go-round, I'm okay. thinking that probably wouldn't be my best, okay. best life decision. <laughs> well, you and I share a, a, a tremendous commonality. Uh, uh, Years ago, uh, not that many, but years ago, when I was a little kid, there was a little merry-go-round in the mall, and it was a two, two, two-story merry-go-round. And I went on the top uh, uh, with my son, got very, very dizzy. On, on yeah, I'm and, pretty sure spaceships do more than that. <laughs> I can't even imagine. I, I just had to ask That's, you that. You can't imagine. That's why you won't do it. Yeah. So yeah. So the last thing uh, uh, I wanted to ask that I extracted from my notes here, um, and I'd love to know this because sometimes I, I, I suffer from symptoms of this and trying to be creative. What causes creative block and how do you overcome it? Now, that's my last question for you. Oh, yeah, and that's what my writing program is about. Okay, there's two primary causes. One, the natural way we express our thoughts is what we're doing now. We talk. You don't send one-year-old babies to talk school. You know, they eventually, by the time they're three or four, unless it's some serious neurological problem, they talk. Then you can't shut them up, but they talk. So talking comes naturally. Writing, 90% of high school seniors can't write a paragraph coherently. So if writing was a natural thing, you're using your hands to output your thoughts. And how do you do that? You create symbols called letters, either on a keyboard, or using a writing instrument, but you're basically converting ideas into symbols and embodying them into symbols. And that's a different process than speaking. And so making the switch from speaking to creating symbols with your hand one way or another doesn't come naturally. That's one cause. The second cause is the difference between the left and right brain. As we now know both sides do everything. It's not one side does one thing and one does but there's a preponderance of editing, spell checking, grammar checking, small chunk procedural left brain. It's your editor, it's your grammar checker. It's the part that says, I don't like what I wrote. I need to do it over. The right brain is pre predominantly your storyteller. Doesn't care spelling, grammar, wants to tell a story. So most people they'll write 20, 30 sentences. They look at what they wrote and say, this is crap. This is terrible. It doesn't work, they cross it out, and they do it over and over and over and over, nothing gets done. The, the solution is one, get an idea and create a strong outline. That's left brain linear. Then let your right brain create the story in the sequence of the pattern, one step at a time, without any concern for spelling, grammar, agreement, syntax. You could be C minus, D plus, doesn't matter. You don't correct anything. Now, when it's done, the first draft is done, you go back with your left brain and you perfect it. You clean up the grammar, you clean up the writing, you clean up the agreement, you bring it up. So you don't do it in one stage. When people try to write and edit at the, uh, at the same time, they get brain freeze, writer's block. And neither side of their brain is happy. The writing side of the brain is frustrated because you keep crossing out. And the editing side of your brain is frustrated because it's crap. It doesn't meet the standards that it set for itself. So the solution is don't do them at the same time. Alternate a left brain activity, creating a good outline with a right brain activity, telling the story with a left brain activity, editing the story. And I go through that step by step by step, berglearning.com and the writing program. The reading program is really a learning program, how to read, how to understand, what to look for, 
how to know when you found it, how to not learn things nobody cares about, you don't waste time, how to remember, how to stay in the right frame of mind to use it when you need it. So when you combine it, reading is input, writing is output. They're the same thing in reverse. Mm -hmm. You want to be a good reader, learn how to look at good writing. You want to be a good writer, look at good reading. You look at what other people have done that works. Can I give you a way to do that that would be helpful before yes. we read? Yes. When you take notes, most people take notes on what they're learning. That's what note taking is. No, that's one third of the data. Set up a three column table in Word. The first column is five things you're looking for when you're studying. The new words, the names, who's in the book, numbers, date, statistics, formula, the main ideas in each section and questions and answers. So you write the word in column one, the definition in two, the name in one, what they did in two, the number in one, why it's important in two, the main idea, trigger word, the idea, question and answer. You also in column two, what did the speaker or writer do that got you interested? Did they tell a story? Did they tell a joke? Did they show up? Whatever they did that got you to go, wow, you can do that when you're writing or when you're speaking. You found something that makes someone go, wow, write that down too. It's a meta program. You're learning their meta program, what they did to create the epiphany. Now in the third column, and this is very important, how will you use what you just learned? So imagine I'm at a marketing seminar with a friend of mine, Dan Kennedy, brilliant marketer. And I see a new idea he has that can double my, my, my sales. So I'm gonna write in the third column precisely how I'll use that idea in my business to double my sales. And then when I go home, I look at all the things I decided I was gonna do from what I learned and do them. And in the process of doubling my sales and all the other things that I said I was gonna do, the experiences of seeing the benefits coming from the action that I'm taking will lock it in permanently. Why would I want to remember something and increase my income 100%? You're never going to forget that because of the experience. So that's what people need to be doing. First column is the information. Second column is insight, significance, what made it interesting. Third column, application, how you use it. If you do that, you'll triple the amount of data you're taking in. You'll learn it faster. You remember it better. And it won't take as long for you to recall the information when you actually want to take and use it in life. That's just a little something I thought. Notes. Uh -huh. There you go. Notes. Very important. Very, very notes. important. There it is. There it is. I did take notes. Well, um, uh, I continue to be swimming in, and I cannot thank you enough for your time and, and your passion uh, and making me 2001. Uh, and, and, and I will value that very, very much. And, and, and you know what, Howard, whenever you're in the mood, hey, we could just, uh, by the way, we could probably tangentialize quite a bit. Uh, you, you know I, how to reach me. You have my information. I, I like do. what I do. I feel I have a responsibility. I'm reading 80 pages a minute. I feel it's a gift. And I look at the news and does anyone think there's too many smart people making too many good decisions? No one's telling me that. So I feel my karma, my dharma is to empower people. I look at kids, they're getting global warming, they're getting exploding deficit, they're getting problems that are gonna cripple them. Let's make them smart enough to fix it. In fact, would you like me to solve a big problem before I go, how to go completely green, increase income for, oil, gas, and coal companies simultaneously create hundreds of thousands of jobs and pay off the national debt in 90 seconds. Do it. Okay. How do you make electricity? You spin a wire in a, co a coil of wire in a magnet or a magnet around a coil of wire. That's basically how you make electricity, mostly. So how do you spin it? Well, if you got a river like the Agra Falls, uh, you got water power, but most of them are steam. Where does the steam come from? Oil, gas, coal, Nuclear fusion, fission, no, no yeah, fusion, 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 not fusion, fission, fusion, fusion, uh, fission. fission, fusion, they're still working on. So that's where the heat comes from. Fine. Problem is there's side effects from what they're doing and 
you know, what are you going to do? Have no electricity or clean air? I mean, that's kind of where people are looking. What do we do? We need electricity. Here's how you do it. In Iceland, it's a volcano. And they use the magma because it's close to the surface to heat the water, which is totally green. It's using the geothermic heat of the earth. You have a lot of water. It's an island. You have geothermal heat. Well, that would be great. If America was an island with a big volcano, it would be perfect. Unfortunately, we're not. However, we have the, one of the largest super volcanoes in the world in Yellowstone Park, which is 300 miles of magma and lots of water. So you get the oil, gas, and coal companies to build geothermal power plants. It's got to be easier to find magma in Yellowstone than a new oil field. And you get the people like the coal miners who are out of work, train them on how to build this. Wow. So they're, re, they're reemployed. You're not taking anything away from them. You're adding. And it's on American Park property. So you charge a usage fee for every kilowatt. And you use that money to pay off the national debt. So in one swim, single way, you create endless amounts of green energy. You employ people who would be displaced. We create more income for the companies that would have lost money by going green and you pay off the national debt. That's what we need. We need to make people smart enough to figure out solutions to problems like that one. That's why I'm asking them to go to Berg Learning. I can't make them go. I can make them smarter if they do go. Take the first step. Go to berglearning.com. We'll help you if you need help. We'll make sure you learn it. I'm a Rotary president. We'll make sure you learn it. If they can't help you, I help personally. I wow. want people to get what they pay for. I don't just want money. I want to make a difference. <clears throat> I want to make sure everybody actually reaches their full potential. And today, people are struggling to make a living. People with good educations are struggling to make a living. People without education are completely despondent. The machines are taking away all the jobs. We still manufacture in America. We just don't need people to do it. <clears throat> There's plenty of manufacturing it's being done by robots, and it's only going to get worse. So the only future for people today is to get smarter, to learn something that no one else is doing and make a better living than you ever made before. And it's not going to come from sitting on your behind and wondering what's happening. It's going to come from reading and studying and thinking and learning how to use that information to change your life. That's what I'm trying to do not sell reading programs, change people's lives, make a better world. I'm just writing this. I actually, I can go back and listen. Thank make you. Some, yeah, I'm taking notes here on air and I can go back and look at it. And, 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 I hope you well, enjoyed it. I went a little oh, off a plan, but- Oh, no, this, it, it, you know what? This was perfect. I, we started the whole day off. I, you asked me how I was and I said, perfect. And we you did. And I did, and, and, and then now to wrap up, what a perfect way to wrap up. Uh, this was perfect with you. Uh, and, and one of my favorite words is, this time with you has been sumptuous. <laughs> I'm delicious. <laughs> sumptuous. Tell my wife what a lucky woman she is. <laughs> then you can tell her I said so on air, you're sumptuous. And this time has been sumptuous. I, I borrowed that word from, from the, the movie Norma Ray at the end uh, when uh, Rod Liebman's, um, Ron Liebman's character tells Sally Field, my time with you has been sumptuous. And, and so I'm saying that to you, Howard. I don't say that very often. Well, thank you, so that's I'm very kind. Thank you, my highest compliment on a Friday afternoon in December. So uh, uh, hopefully to be continued with us and we'll come up we with- We can do stuff. so much more. We know how to comprehend yeah. and remember. We'll be uh, here next time. We'll make yep, a, I will be in touch. Uh, in touch with, with you. some fun. Yep, and I, I can't thank you enough and, and happy and healthy and all good things for the new year and the holidays and you too. All good stuff. Thank Let's you. Make so a better much. world. The world yeah. needs help. I know. I'm, pain. I'm, you can feel the pain. You can actually feel the I know it's, it's palpable. And I'm doing everything in my power to help make a difference. I can't do it myself, but if I teach enough people to think and learn. And they make the changes that they can make successfully, that can make a difference. And that's yeah. what I'm doing. And, and I'm trying to bring people together in my end too. Uh, so, you know, we're each trying to do this, something. This, 
You know, there's a um, there's an old saying that comes from uh, uh, it's a tribal thing. Uh, he who he or she who saves a life saves the world. I don't know if you ever heard that before, but no, but it's a nice saying. It's I agree a great with it. saying. He he or she who saves a life saves the world. Um, and, and, and I have a funny it. story on that, real fast. Yes. Winston Churchill, when he was a young boy, he was driving in a car with, with, with his father and um, trying to think, uh, they had a terrible car accident and this farmer took them in and got them to the hospital and uh, his father, Richard Churchill's father was very wealthy. So he paid for the, the farmer's son to go to, to, go to school, wow. to go to college. Wow. And his son, when he got older, was the inventor of penicillin. Fleming. That's how, that's how Fleming got to go Fleming. to college. It was Winston Churchill's father who paid for his education. Wow. Years later, Winston Churchill got a terrible infection and penicillin saved his life. Wow. What a so, great story. Save a life. Yeah. You, you just, just life, don't know how it's going to come back on you. Yeah. He, his family was saved by the farmer and they saved, they, and the farmer's son saved his life. Later wow. On. What a great story. I'm going to use that with your permission. Sure. Yep. I didn't invent it. It's a story. I know. <laughs> I know. Great story. Anyway, uh, just thank you so much, Howard. Uh, berglearning.com uh, and uh, I will be in touch. Thank you. Take care. Have a wonderful new year. See you, you soon. Too.